Come on up, everybody up on the deck here. The water so one pass comes in, goes out. What you're looking at here are uh, 40 day old Mahi Mahi, born and raised here. One place in the world you can see this. So these are all <coughs> the process. I'm sure Martin may or may not have described to you. We catch fish offshore, develop techniques over the years to acclimate them to captivity and transport them safely. Acclimate them to our land based tanks. Reduce them to spawn naturally. So we're not putting them with hormones or anything else you may have heard of since those are uh, obstacles. Uh, we do some of the spawn naturally in the tanks outside. They produce fertilized eggs for us, and we bring those eggs into the hatchery, where the eggs hatch in about 36 hours in our ambient water temperature conditions. And then we begin the larva culture process. So the larva culture process goes from about zero when they hatch to 30 days post hatch. So these guys are just done. These are weaned onto a dry pellet. During that larva culture stage, is the most challenging aspect of the, the growth cycle of mine because of the most doing in captivity. Because at that point, when they hatch out, you can't put them on the flake food that you buy in Petco. You have to actually produce plankton to feed these animals. So we produce different kinds of plankton here, and it's not just a species of plankton, it's what they are enriched with. So in much the same way the human babies drink formula, and companies spend millions of dollars doing all the R&D to develop this magic formula to feed the baby. We have to do the same thing for each species of marine fish we work with. So the enrichment that is good for a mahi, for instance, may not necessarily be what's good for a cobia. Jumping around here, they're happy to see you guys. <laughs> they're, uh, you know, they're <clears throat> very high energy fish. And so during that larva culture stage, we're feeding them live planktonic organisms, and then eventually we wean them onto an inert diet, which you see in that uh, box there. So a pelletized diet, which will also supplement with chopped up squid, sardines, keep them in natural prey base also. So at this point, all throughout the life cycle here in the lab, we're using the different experiments to look at the effects of the oil spill. So what are the effects on juvenile fish? What are the effects on embryos? All different questions we can answer by working with this fish which is a great model species for pelagic fish. They are pelagic fish. They were there in the zone of where the deep water horizon spill occurred. So it's great to be able to work with this fish and run realistic exposure scenarios on them as opposed to trying to extrapolate from the results on coastal organisms like gold killing fish and say, oh, the exposure levels had a decent effect on that organism are the same as what might occur for a high body out in the open ocean. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Maybe we're testing it on a sort of the native fish without the smell side. It's high. The ocean? I don't know. If these were salmon, they'd be about nine months old. Yeah. Okay. So very fast growing. Survival of the fittest in here. The small and the weak. The ones that get chewed on and beat up. You see these ones, you know, there's always a few bullies in the tank, right? So, uh, <clears throat> it's nasty in there. We tear each other up, and we just have to do our best advantage. So, what you see here, they go from that small stage to this, 50 days. Pretty impressive. So we use them to 